Men så går kring Lund. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Unlike, unlike speakers uh, before me, they are all lawyers. I am addressing this uh, bill from a layman's term, uh, view. As someone who do feel uncomfortable with detention without trial. In the 2017 and 2018 Rule of Law Index compiled by the World Justice Project, Singapore was ranked 13th globally for the rule of law, which I think is a good ranking on the state of our judicial system and how much we have uphold the principle of rule of law. Today, we are here debating on this very difficult and important bill, the extension of the operation of the Criminal Law Temporary Provisions Bill, CLTPA. Mr. Speaker, I recognize the tensions between wanting to balance the protection of the rights of an accused and to ensure that our society is protected against serious crimes and to keep crimes rapes low. This provisions, however, departs from two fundamental principles of the rule of law, the rights to a fair trial and that individuals should be governed largely by the law and not by discretion. It is true that the, crime, the crimes which the CLTPA seeks to prevent are no doubt serious and involves complex considerations. But are there other options and measures that might be less intrusive than detention without trial, yet equally effective to address the problem which the CLTPA seeks to achieve? Has the government, before taking the decision to extend the operation of the CLTPA, considered these options? Can the government share with the House what these options are and the evaluations of their strengths and weaknesses? Mr. Speaker, my point is that if there are security measures that impose less deprivation of the accused rights, and at the same time as effective as detention without trial in addressing the security issue, then such options that intrude less on the rights of an accused should always be preferred. While the threats which the CLTPA address involves a severe nature, it does not lead to an automatic conclusion that the only way to deal with this serious stress is by detaining individuals without trials. It is a policy choice that we made, and one that requires robust justification, backed by concrete evidence. Mr. Speaker, as this House debates the extension of the operation of CLTPA for the 14th time, I hope that as we continue to justify its existence and relevance to today's context, we do not forget about having a meaningful debate on the reduction of our reliance on the CLTPA. I note from the Minister's statement that the number of people detained under CLTPA has gone low. However, however, as its name suggests, this bill was meant to be temporary. One of the justifications for the retention of this bill is that there are difficulties with persecuting, prosecuting those detained as involved witnesses feared reprisal should they testify in courts. This is a legitimate concern that must be addressed, but it points to a larger discussion as to whether there are sufficient protection of witnesses in general under our laws rather than the continuing assistance of CLTPA. <clears throat> there have been proposed amendments to the Evidence Act and the Criminal Procedure Code to enhance protection of witnesses recently. The Cy Cybersecurity Bill, which was passed yesterday in the same House, contains a provision to protect informants. We should re-evaluate the necessity of CLTPA in light of these new measures to protect witnesses and consider tweaking witness protection methods to better protect witnesses to offences which the CLTPA are applicable, rather to continue relying on detaining individuals without trials as part of an overall security strategy. Mr. Speaker, detention without trial is by no means, by all means, an exceptional measure which I principally disagree with. By further extending the CLTPA, I worry that it normalizes and desensitizes society to its extreme nature and further entrenches the necessity of the CLTPA. In all, I hope we keep with the spirit of the CLTPA, which was originally set out only to be of a temporal 
nature, meant to address a unique set of problems arising from a specific period of time. Mr. Speaker, I turn now to discuss the proposed amendment to the CLTPA. One of the amendments, Clause 3, states that the Minister's decision to detain an individual, an individual or, sub, or subject him to a supervisory order is final. Many MPs have talked about it, and the Minister has clarified. However, after going to and fro, I wonder if it is imprudent for me to ask if perhaps this, this, this particular change be reworded or be removed to avoid any more dis misrepresentation because we can hear that so many people are and they are lawyers who have been asking for clarifications and we do not want in future that it be misread. Mr. Speaker, the Minister has unequivocally said that the judiciary is co-equal and important branch of the government. Its constitutional duty in reviewing the legality of the acts of the executive must be respected and protected by other branches of the government. Each time the approval from the parliament to extend the operation of CLTPA is sought, the question of the sufficiency of safeguard of this bill remains in the forefront. We have heard the minister outlining the six steps of safeguarding. My position is that the safeguards to prevent an abuse of power under CLTPA is not sufficiently robust as the checks and balance are largely undertaken by the executive, save for the consent of the public prosecutor and not by another independent arm of the government. <coughs> Let me explain. Under Section 30 of the CLTPA, while there is an advisory committee that will submit a report with recommendations on the minister's order to the president, the advisory committee recommendation remains non-binding as such. Even if the advisory committee recommends that the individual not be detained, the minister is legally, not legally obliged to follow the advisory committee's recommendations. Further, while the president may confirm, vary, or can cancel the minister's order, the president acts on the advice of the cabinet, which also comprises of the minister who made that order. This seems almost like a case of the executive checking on itself. So, even when the Cabinet's advice contradicts that of the advisory committee, how does the President make her decision? What if the President of the same, is of the same view as the advisory committee, but different from that of the Cabinet, what would happen next? Mr. Speaker, while there is no evidence that the power of the CLTPA have been abused, the commitment to ensure sufficient independent safeguards is not to question the integrity of the decision maker but precisely to prevent such an abuse and to refine decision-making. Given that the det detention without trial involves a serious deprivation of one's liberty, should there not be more oversight than, rather than less? Moreover, the introduction of the fourth schedule to limit the types of offences which a CLTPA is applicable is an implicit recognition that all powers must have legal limits. Consistent with the fundamental rule of law with the fundamental rule of law principle that all powers have legal limits scrutiny of the minister's decision by another independent arm of the government the judiciary is an important check and balance with this speaker and at this moment through this debate i find myself not able to support the terms that is proposed in these amendments thank you Order. I propose to take a break now and suspend the sitting for 20 minutes and we'll take the chair at 2.30. Order. Order.